whole time. Y'all looking good. I know you can't help it. God made us this way. That's right. That's exactly right. So here we go. We're going to... Um, when he made us, he was showing off. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we're going to go ahead and get into get into it. And I'm, I'm going to just to one, one tonight, we're going to kind of go over the other, other ones quickly, and then we're going to go right into tonight. All right? Let's pray. Father... We love you, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for this opportunity to be here, God, to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. I ask you right now, Lord, open our hearts, our minds, our spirits. Yes, enable us to see, Lord, as you would like to show it to us, Lord. Help us to receive it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And we love you and thank you for it. Church said? Amen. 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 Now, also, uh, Eddie, can you pass around that? that they can ask about last week. So can you pass around? Okay. Now, let's pray. Father? I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace and mercy. I know, God, that you've heard all these requests, Lord, and you know them better than we do. And not only do you know the request, you know the answer for each of them, the proper answer, the best answer. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch each one, bring healing where healing's needed, bring understanding where understanding's needed, and bring hope where hope's needed. We trust you right now, God, to take care of all these problems. For we truly give them to you, and we're not going to take them back. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We give all this sickness to you, Lord, and all this this uh, anxiety to you right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, Amen. Amen. All right. Last week, week four last, we started on uh, five ways God uses your problems. And I'm just going to really quickly go over the majority of your outline pretty fast. I'm not even going to cut, hit everything, but I'm just going to hit parts of it. And then we're going to go into this week. Uh, one thing we seem to forget is when we're going through problems is God already knows we've got the problem and God already has a plan for the problem. Every problem we go through, every, somebody say every. Yeah. Every. every problem we go through, God has a plan for it. Whether it, for the, the plan is to teach us something in one way or the other or to develop us in one way or the other. If we're in trouble because of something we did, then it's there to teach us not to do it again or to teach us to do it a better way. And uh, if it's uh, something that he allowed, then he's going to use it for his glory. And if it's something that, that he did, he's, he's actually trying to, uh, which will be in number, what's going to be tonight, is to correct us or to get us going in the right direction. So there's, there's the three myths about the problems. You can ignore them and they'll go away. No, you can't. You cannot ignore problems. They will not go away on their own. Most problems will hang until you do something about it. Number two, <laughs> myth. I can do nothing about my problems. Yes, you can. There's not a problem in here that you can't do something about. You may not can fix it, but you can do something about it. And number three, do not believe this. Time will not heal all wounds. Time makes, makes all time does is make them either permanent in your mind or they make them start to gradually fade away. But how many here have actually forgot about things and all of a sudden somebody mentioned somebody's name and all of a sudden you remembered it and all of a sudden your heart did like that and the pain come back real? Why? Because time did not heal the wound. Okay? All time did was make you just forget about it. But as soon as it's brought back up, whoa! So, proper healing and proper proper uh, instruction or handling it through time, handling it the proper way through time has the potential to heal the wound. It's like a death in the family. You never, you never get over a death in the family. You learn how to deal with it. How many here has had lost loved ones and you just got over it? I mean, it's just over. No, you learn how to deal with it. I think about my mama. I think about my, my, my wife. I think about my grandparents. All the time I'm thinking about these people. They're always in my mind. And uh, uh, it's, just, it, it's just, I can think of them now most of the time without crying or without shutting up. I can talk about it. But for the first, first few weeks during all this stuff, it was hard to talk because it just it was such, so painful, emotionally painful. So again, I don't think about them. I dream about them. Yeah, they're there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when you dream about them, that's even that, that means that they're heavy on your mind. And a dream is a subconscious way of your of your brain. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a good word for it, but but when you when you dream, your mind's processing your thoughts. Okay. And so it's processing thoughts that you maybe have in the back of your head. Can I tell y'all something? I experienced when my, pa my father passed away. I had never been around anybody I was really, really close to that uh -huh. was dying. And when my daddy was dying, 
I went down there and my sister and I were sitting in a room and with him and I said, well, if I lay back and go to sleep, maybe my sister will because she's been there the night mm -hmm. before. And so I laid back in the chair and uh, all of a sudden the Lord said, start singing praises to me. And I didn't even think, I just started singing praises like we sing now, you know, our hymns, you know, uh, little praise songs. And next thing I knew, my sister joined me. And then I, I don't know how long we did it. I have no idea. But when I woke up, I thought, I haven't checked Daddy. And I checked him, and he was at peace, and his face was smiling. But, you know, that changed my outlook. Um, I was more at peace when my mama died, when my, when Lester died. You know, when it, 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 it changed my outlook especially if I knew where they were going, you know. Uh, you still don't forget, you still remember them, but it was something that happened to me that really changed my whole life. Oh, yeah. I, I was watching television the other day. Bethany said, watch this, Dad. And it was a television about people that had died and come back. And this is scientific. This is just not some off-the-wall mess. This was some scientific proof because doctors were backing up the stories. And, and there was one guy said he had drowned and said as soon as he took in that first... He said, oh, the last thing he remember was taking in that water, breathing in that water. And he said immediately he was someplace else. He said he saw the lights, all the stuff. He said, and God told him it weren't time yet. He had to come on back. And he said he got angry with God because he had to come back. Oh, really? I would have yeah. Been. <laughs> yeah, and there's another guy had got, another guy uh, said he came back, and the Lord said he had something for him to do. And he got, he was trying to work for the Lord, but at the same time, he got tied up in some other stuff, and he got, depressed and he wound up backsliding and he, I think if I'm not mistaken he said he committed suicide and as he committed suicide he said the Lord spoke to him and said and told him and said look I'm not through with you yet now handle it <laughs> go back <laughs> he said so he got mad at God because he had to go back you know so again there was this this, this amazing thing these guys whether they whether, no matter how they had died drowning one died on the operating table, one had committed suicide, all these things that had gone on, and every last one of them, because the key ingredient was they were a child of God before all this happened. If you're a child of God, then he says, nothing shall stand in between you. And so all these guys, you know, they talk about the light, and they talk about the being, and they talk about seeing Jesus, and it was just amazing. That show was amazing to listen to. And one guy said, one guy was electric, I mean, a bug man. He was under the house. And there was an exposed wire, and he backed up on the exposed wire, and the guy he was working on, or working for, said he didn't normally watch everybody work, but he went down and watched him and heard when they got electrocuted. So he pulled him out, and he said they worked on him, and he said that he didn't want to come back. He said it was the most peaceful place he'd ever been. He said, but now he's not afraid of death at all. Because every, last, every last one of them that came back said we're no longer afraid of death. Wow, that's pretty cool. All right, so here we go. Oh, go ahead. Yep. Um, going back to uh, time heals all wounds, mm -hmm. which is false. I like what Fonzie said about that. Okay. Time wounds all heals. That's right. <laughs> time wounds all heals. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three, four, happy days. <laughs> Do you have any copies of part one? That's okay. This, Don't go this get is them. part three. And I just got... wondered if we could get some afterwards. Yeah, if you get part... If you get part two, you're going to have part one and part two. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. This is, this is the whole thing. You got, you got the whole thing. I don't know. Okay. But next, next, there's, next, there's a little bit more. But next, next part's going to be different. Because I can't put all this on one page. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I've got. <clears throat> I thought you said part you... two, and so I thought we missed last yeah. week. No, you got it. You got it. everything's here. I try to do it this consolidated way. Consolidated so you... it. Yeah. I try. Yeah, I try to consolidate it. So just in case you can't get a hold of one outline, it'll stand alone by itself. Okay. So first, uh, God uses problems to direct us five ways, and of course, uh, sometimes He's got a light of fire under us to get us moving, and that's what He did with Jonah. He, he used a fire to direct, I mean, used a problem to direct him. He was said to go a couple hundred miles in this direction. Instead, he went a couple of thousand miles in this direction. The cool thing is once he got inside that fish, the fish took him right back where he was supposed to go. And, and my mom used to say, son, and when I come up, my mom used to always tell me, don't say vomit. 
She used to get so mad at me for saying vomit. So they say, throw up, son. Don't say vomit. Vomit makes me sick. And I said, okay, mama. So one night I was preaching, and she was staying with me in Benson. I was preaching. I was preaching on Jonah, and I got that part. The, I was reading the Bible. <laughs> and I got the part that said, the fish vomited him out. I looked over at mama. I said, did you hear that, mama? Vomited him out. <laughs> And mama, mama just looked at me and smiled. I said, I didn't say it. God did. <laughs> so you go to him. <laughs> All right. It was funny. All right. Secondly, God uses problems to inspect us. Uh, uh, the gold, the silver, when it goes in the fire, it goes in and it's burnt. And the draught the, the draw comes up. The, 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 the bad stuff comes up to the top. And the guy just keeps throwing it off and throwing it off until finally he burns it and nothing else comes up. No impurities come up. Then he know it's pure when he can see his reflection and he stops burning it. So when, Jesus, when God can see our reflection, his reflection in us, he knows it's time. The third way, and here's where we're going to stop for tonight. God uses, and here, here's, here's where you got to be careful. Man, you got to be careful. Because God can be using a problem to direct you and, and somebody comes in, a well-meaning Christian, wanted a Job comforter, and tell you that God's trying to correct you. When he's actually trying to direct you. Or he's trying to inspect you, and they say God's trying to correct you. Because in their mind, it's all one thing. But it's not. Okay? Direction. Getting you in a certain direction for his glory. Inspection. He's, see, he's seeing what you got inside, but to correct us. I want to think of it this way. And think, you can think of it this way. Think about this. God's trying to direct us, and we ignore it. God tries to inspect us, and we ignore it. Think about it that way. So after we've ignored the direction, after we've ignored the inspection, the next is God's going to have to correct us. He's tried to direct us. He's tried to uh, inspect us, and now he's going to correct us. Okay? Now, some lessons we only learn through pain and failure. Amen. How many here, actually, I heard it said that God whispers to us in our, in our good times, but he screams to us in our pain. The Holy Spirit, excuse me, the Holy Spirit. You hear him whisper when things are going good, but when things are going bad, he screams. You can hear him. All right? Here we go. Before you go on. All right, go ahead. Under the inspection, um, he already knows what's in it, but we need to know. Exactly, it's, it's more of um, it's for us. It's, it's more of a revelation to us what's in there. One of your recent texts is when the wind blows and shakes the tree. That's when the fruit falls. Yeah, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and you don't really realize what's in there until your cage gets rattled. That's right. And sometimes when my cage is rattled, I'm disappointed. Oh yeah, if you if you if you if <laughs> very you, disappointed. If if you poke me, you, I might think I'm full of apple juice, and you poke me, and I'm actually full of lemon juice or vinegar. Or vinegar. I, I mean, apple juice that doesn't go bad. Yeah. <laughs> and so so I'm thinking I got it together. And that's part of the inspection part too. Is it lets you know what you what you got going on inside of you because. Once God inspects me, he lets me know, you know what, buddy, you don't have it all together like you think you got it all together. Because you just went through inspection. When I, when I, I, I despise taking my car to an inspection place, and here it goes. I went there not long ago, and, and I had a, a, just a, a, a little bad wire. Every now and then it would go out of the way. Just every now and then on one of the lights, Bukes are bad about this, and it... Uh, the sabers are very bad about it. Everybody's got one tells me they have these problems. And so I go to get my car inspected, and they go, you got a bad light. I said, okay. So they ordered a part. So $50 later, and plus whatever they charge to do it, uh, it still didn't work. So they said, we got to do something else. So I went home and did a Fonzie on it. <laughs> light came on. So I went to the inspection place. Before I got out, of, before before they went to inspect, I went and did it again. <laughs> I mean, it didn't go out anymore. It hadn't been out since. But it did the Fonzie, and I thought about if I could have got him to do the Fonzie, I wouldn't have had to pay whatever that was, fifty dollars plus whatever. Was that an engine light? No, 
Cool. It was a, it was one of those parking lights. Cool. It has all these little parking lights, a little saber that just that are hard to get to. Uh, somebody told me a secret to making sure they work longer is to use dielectric grease on all your contacts. Fill that critter up and plug your light in, and it don't corrode. But cool. it put what in it? Dielectric grease, contact grease. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's a tight. It's, I mean, that's what you go to the car parts place. You tell them you want dielectric grease. I don't know why it's called dielectric, but the stuff keeps your all your contact points from corroding. And what it is, rust gets in there and breaks the connection. When you do the Fonzie bump, the rust falls out and it makes connection again. <laughs> that, yeah. That's not white grease. Is. No, it's not. No, no it's, that's lithium grease. It's lithium. Uh, most of the time it's clear. So now, God uses problems to correct us. Listen, listen, I wrote it down here. It's like your parents told you not to touch a hot stove. How many times have your parents told you not to do something because it was going to hurt and you walked away with a blister? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, my parents said, don't touch that. Oh, and Lord knows, wet paint. Yeah. My daddy told me as a teenager, he says, I could share all of my mistakes with you so that you could learn from them. He said, but you're probably going to have to do them yourself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's true. Yep. Well, my, my, daddy's favorite saying, my daddy's favorite saying was, that'll learn you. Mm -hmm. That'll learn you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got, there you go. You got a 15, 50 pound TV on a 10 pound TV tray. And you over they got you adjusting and stuff and it falls over on you. Mama goes and Daddy said they've been told not to go over there. You over there and it falls on you. Mama's all to pieces because you got a fifty pound TV laying on you and Daddy's going, that'll learn them. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so so sometimes we only learn the value. Listen carefully. This is very powerful. Sometimes we only learn the value of something, health, money, relationships, by losing. Until we lose it, we don't really understand what we lost. You know, uh, uh, I had no idea how hard it was going to hurt after I lost my mama. I had no idea how hard it was going to hurt and that I lost my wife. You know, uh, there, there's things that, that certain people that I worked with, and, and, and I just thought of them as, as they were a valid resource on the job. But after they died, I find there was a valid resource on the job. They were a valid resource for me. And then they're gone. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so uh, let's go ahead and kind of incorporate this, so we so we can pray about this. And if you got any questions, uh, Psalm 119, 71 and 72. I'd like to actually go to uh, to verse 66 or, or 67. It says the best thing that could happen to me for it taught me to pay attention to my laws. Watch this. Psalm 67, Psalm 119 and 67 says, before I, went before I was afflicted, I went astray. Now, y'all got to think about this. This is David talking, one of the greatest men of God that ever lived. But now I keep and honor your word with loving obedience. It is good for me that I've been afflicted, this is verse 71, that I may learn your statutes, 72, the law from your mouth is better to me than ten thousands of gold and silver pieces. Seventy-three. Your hands have made me and established me, giving me understanding and a teachable heart that I may learn your commandments. A teachable <coughs> heart. You know, uh, I've known people that did not have a teachable heart, and they went through enough problems that they became they became teachable. I had somebody in my family come to me, and this was about... Uh, uh, I went to them one day, and they said... They said something about how that how great they were doing on their job and how great they've been getting along and blah, 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 blah. I said, well, you need to thank God for your job and thank God for getting along as good as you're doing. And this person, one of my elders, said, you have no idea what you're talking about. He said, I don't need to thank God for my paycheck and I don't need to thank God for what I got because I work for that money. I work go to that job every day and I take care of myself. I don't need to thank God. Look at what I've done. About a month later, the person had been there for 20 years. About a month later, that's when the insurance started going up like this. Back then, the spouses were counting on the insurance with you. 
All of a sudden now, the spouse was counted, no longer counted in on the insurance, and the spouse's insurance was like five times what the employee's insurance was. Plus they did a change in taxes. So now this guy who said he done it himself, he took care of it, he did it all, come to me and he said, I'm about to lose everything I got. He said, I need you to help me and I helped him. And he said, I need you to help me two ways. I need you to help me catch up on this bill and I did. And then he said, and I need you to help me pray to God for forgiveness. He said, because it does come from God. And I realize now that God is my source, and God is my strength, and God does take care of me. And about a week or two later, he got a new job making twice as much money. Twice. Twice. Sometimes, because he worked on, because he, he worked sometimes overtime, sometimes three times as much money on this next job. Once he told God, okay, God, I'm sorry, I blew it, it's hitting me, this is it. <laughs> So again, here it is. God used that to correct his attitude. Amen? Has God ever used things to correct your attitude? I mean, I get at, I like to say sometimes, I just, I just get attitude correctness. I mean, God just corrects it. I, here, let me read this to you. Uh, to see, you've got, I wrote this down a couple times. I really like, like what it says. The Common English Version says, when you, in verse 71 to 73, when you corrected me, it did me good because it taught me to study your laws. I would rather obey you than to have a thousand pieces of silver and gold. You created me and put me together. Make, make me wise enough to learn what you have commanded. And then, uh, uh, I love what the message, the message just crowns it. My troubles turned out for the best. My troubles turned out all for the best. They forced me to learn from your textbook. Truth from your mouth means more to me than striking it rich in a gold mine. Now, now, now let, let's, let's kind of, we're going to go over a few more scriptures. Let me just get something straight about correction and discipline. When we talk about discipline, most of the time when you think about discipline, you think about a tree and a switch. You think about a belt. You think about putting your nose in the corner. you got all these negative connotations about discipline and correction. But in God's economy... Not all discipline is negative. As a matter of fact, most of God's discipline is positive. Did you know that? We don't look at it in a negative light. It's positive. Jesus had 12 what? The, the root word for disciple is discipline. Okay? Discipline is not a bad word. We've made it a bad word. We, we've made it a bad word. We, we, we've got a negative to it. My, my daddy used to beat the fire out of me. And I remember, you know, with the belt and him holding by my hand, I'm running. Where am I going to go? I'm running. He beat me. Didn't do a bit of good. I could run, 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 run. He'd just make it worse because he'd get to find other places to hit. That's so how I thought of this one. I thought about my Heavenly Father discipline. I said, oh, no, this is going to hurt. And it does hurt sometimes. But you know what? Now that I'm older... And now that I am a father, and now that my father shows me, to me, discipline, I would say discipline is more positive than negative. I agree. Okay, yeah, it's a good thing. Matter of fact, the Bible even says, uh, uh, Proverbs 13 and 24, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Meaning, look, look, I love my sons. And so I'm going to make sure that they're going to take care. I'm going to make sure. And you know what? They didn't like it when they were coming up. But now I'm watching them with their kids. And they're going, Dad, I'm so glad you taught me this. I'm so glad you showed me this. I'm so glad you gave me this example. Because I didn't take them like by the hand like my dad did in front of everybody in the yard and just whip them all around the place. I carried them in another room. I explained to them what was going on. We prayed about it. And, of course, they got a few licks, but, but that was a whole different ball game. Because I said, I want you to know how our father does it. Our father. Okay. So, so again, uh, uh, here we go. I want you to write this down. I want you to think about this for correction. If you, discipline in the Bible. There, there's, there's four things for discipline in the Bible. I want you to write this down. Number one, discipline is for correction. If I'm right, if I am selling... And all of a sudden the wind shifts and I am no longer being propelled. I'm, no, I'm, I'm dead in the water. What do I have to do? 
adjust my sails. I'm sorry, what did you say? I said move your sails. That's right. You're right. <laughs> adjust your sails. That's, a, that's, that's, that's cool. Adjust your sails. I can't do anything about the wind, but I can adjust my sails. All right. So now, this is a correction. For a child, discipline for a child, straighten out a limb so it'll grow straight. So is that negative? Is that negative? Straighten out a what? Straighten out a limb so it'll grow straight. Is that that's not negative? I mean, you're fixing it so it's going to bear a lot of fruit. It's going to be good, All right? And 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 also, so so correction, straighten out a limb so it'll grow straight. Uh, first correction, and then secondly. Uh, in, part of correction is the second word is straighten out the limbs so to grow straight. Okay. I haven't got. Okay. The third one. Prepare you for growth. You know, there's a lot of things we. It, it's like a ship when when the ships. You know, when, when it, it amazes me that that the reason that that Paul's shipwreck was. So catastrophic. One of the reasons is they were trying. They, they were caught in the storm. They were going to they were get ready to get. They weren't caught in the storm yet. They were, they were, but it did little. It. They thought it was okay to sail. Paul said, "You don't need to sail." But they said, "Our laden needs to be gone. We need to take this stuff over there. We don't have time to stop and play your little silly spiritual games. We need to go now." And so they get there and they wind up in a storm. And when they up in the storm, the stuff that they the stuff they were trying to carry, they got them in the storm. They threw it out. By the time they got there, the ship was torn to pieces, and all the the laden was gone. So, again, sometimes God allows us to go through storms. So the, the stuff we're toting that we don't need that's keeping us from growing, we throw it out. I was in the refrigerator last night, and and I was upset with myself. Because I wanted to say, I wanted, my daddy makes this homemade stuff for Christmas, this homemade uh, uh, stuffing out of, out of crackers and giblets and all that. It's really good stuff. Can't find it anywhere else. And my daddy gave me a great big bag of it. And I was planning on, every Christmas I take a nibble on it until the bag's gone. Well, last night I'm going to the fridge and I went, open the door went. I looked back in the back, and there it looked like I first thought it was a dead critter in a bag. <laughs> and I said, Who has killed a critter and put it in a bag in the refrigerator? So I reached back kind of slow to get it, and I pulled it up, and it's that stuffing. I could have been eating it the whole time, but instead, you know where it went? Trash can. Okay, but again, uh, uh, it didn't do. It would have been awesome to have when it was okay, but now it was no good. So if I'd eaten it now, it'd been bad for me. It would not have promoted growth. It would have promoted growth for the doctor, but not me. <laughs> so I had to get rid of it. There's things in our life that we think is going to help. That we think we've got to have, but it doesn't promote growth. And so God says it's time to turn away from it. So correction: straighten out lips to grow straight. Prepare for growth. And then instruction for good. Instruction for good. Now, now we're in it, we're, this is all the positives. This is, this is as positive as positive can be. I don't see negative. Although some of the stuff is negative because sometimes straightening out that limb hurts. Sometimes the correction hurts. Sometimes preparing for growth hurts. I used to live by these humongous fields when I lived in Merritt. These humongous fields and in the apostle track. These fields around me. And every year when they had corn, they come through with the corn. They'd harvest the corn, and, and they'd have these little bitty old stalks up, little bitty stalks left. And if they had come through and just prepared, or just threw the, threw the, next, the next crop in, they'd have had to grow through all those roots, and it would have been a sorry crop. So they come through. A lot of times they burn the field. Now if they burn the field, they come through and they, they, they till it up. Now if they till it up and then mulch it up, then they come through, and they got everything pulled out now, and then they, they got straight rows, and they come through. Now, Jeremiah says, says for us to, to, to plow up the fallow ground of our heart. And that fallow ground is exactly what I'm talking about. It's been harvested. It's hard. It's got remnants on it.
but it's not productive. It's got remnants. Remnants. It doesn't have the full thing. Just remnants. It's hard. It, and it's hard. Sometimes our heart gets hard. We've got remnants of what God used to do. And so God says, plow up the fallow ground of your heart. All right, so here you go. That's what he's doing. So there's instruction for good, prepare for growth. Uh, also, Hebrews, go ahead, go ahead. Just finally remember it again. Okay. Uh, all the, This ties in with another verse, train up a child in the way he should go when he's old, he will not depart. That's the same thing. Yeah, to, 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 to prepare the limb for growth, to, to bend yep. it. Exactly. To bend the limb. Exactly. And train up a child is discipline. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same. It's all, and it's positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so many people train their young as to go in debt for everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then they live the whole life in debt because that's the way they were trained. Mom and Daddy never had anything. They never had enough to make payments with anything, so I was never trained to go in debt. I learned that all by myself. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and that's a hard lesson to learn, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, buddy. I, what I like is when you go in and look at a car, and the man who looks at what you get says, Let me see what you, how much you make, and blah, 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 blah. And he goes, Oh, you can afford it. How do you know what I can afford? You're not the car dealer. I mean, you, you don't know how much I make, but you don't know how much I'm having to put out every week for, for I got two, two young as I can eat the legs off the table. <laughs> Sometimes I wait for them to go to sleep so I can sneak out the house and grab some more food and come back in. They were terrible. And DC was the world's worst. Hung, I think he was just pure hungry. Linda, bless her heart, she was a single mom trying to raise her kids, and she was finding a hard time to feed them because they ate like horses. And she, then she realized one day, she read this thing uh, where it says, really kind of funny, it said that restaurants, do you know restaurants, what's the favorite color of a restaurant? Red. Place, red. You know why they're red? Red makes you hungry. The color red makes you hungry. So Linda looked around her little kitchen, and her kitchen was painted red. And she had red plates. After she read that story, she went and got white plates and went back and painted <laughs> over. <laughs> did it work? Yes, it did. It did. It really worked. Uh, okay, here we go, and I'm getting really close. Here we go. First uh, Corinthians 9 and 27. This is such a powerful, powerful scripture. Uh, actually, if you, you're going to have to look at verse, uh, we'll look at verse uh, 25 down. It says, and I'm just going to read the. Uh, Amplified version. Well, I got it right here too. Hold on, I got it right here. This is the New King James Version. First, First Corinthians, chapter nine. Twenty-five and twenty-seven. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. First Corinthians, chapter nine. This is some awesome stuff. We'll just go to verse twenty-four. They get they give it the whole context. But do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only what one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things, meaning you, you know how to handle yourself in all situations, and you don't overdo it anywhere. You know, before I, before I got sick uh, and lost, lost 20 pounds, after I lost 20 pounds, I said, well, if I've lost, already lost 20, I can keep on going. I lost 60. One thing I do now is when I, I, only, I only eat when I'm hungry instead of eating all the time. Or I might snack when I'm hungry. I might eat some peanuts or something to keep the appetite down. And when I eat, if I go to a restaurant or something, I'll go ahead and divide it up. And I'll carry the next thing home for either eating it later on or eating it ne next day or two. So I make two plates out of one, but back in the day before I got sick, I'd eat that plate and part of Linda's plate and whoever else's plate. And somebody come by, the bus boy come by, and it looked kind of good on that, so can I have that? You know. Yeah, yeah. And then, then go get, then you get some big dessert. Not anymore. I eat, I eat half to one third of what I used to eat. So, again, and that's part of being uh, of, of, of temperate and all things. 
Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run, therefore I run thus, not for uncertainty. Thus I fight not as one who beats the air or shadow boxing. But I discipline my body and bring it under subjection. That word subjection literally means I give myself a black eye. That's something. I give myself a black eye. I give myself a black eye. Uh, at least that when I have preached to others, I myself should have become disqualified. I'm gonna read you, I'm gonna read you a few other translations. I discipline my body like an athlete training, training to do what I should do. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. And here it is. I'm staying alert in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everybody else about it, and then messing out myself. It's kind of like, uh, I can't remember, I cannot remember even the game. It was a college game. But this guy, this, this, this uh, defensive lineman happens to... Somehow or another, pick up a fumble. And he picks it up, and he's disoriented because he's just been hit. He picks up the fumble at about the five-yard line and starts running. The only problem is he was sort of go five yards that way. <laughs> Instead, he goes 95 yards that way. Pretty soon, he don't understand. He thinks everybody's cheering him on. They're hollering, stop, <laughs> stop. <laughs> And he wonder why he's outrun everybody. It's because they quit chasing him. He finally gets tackled by one of his own players. <laughs> that guy's name was Harrigan. There you go. Wrong way, oh. Harrigan. <laughs> <laughs> there he you go. He lived that the rest of his life. Yes. Yes, he did. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> it's like the man, uh, Lone Chair Larry. Everybody hear about Lone Chair Larry? This is a true story. Lone Chair Larry was just, one day was just sitting around and, and he said, uh, you know, he was one of those thinkers. You know, I'm, thinking, I'm kind of thinking uh, this might be Lone Chair Eddie. But he's sitting around <laughs> thinking. And he said, there's something I can do that might be cool. All right? Or Lone Chair David. Well, neither one of us. <laughs> okay. I'm going to put me in it too. So Lone Chair Eddie. I mean, Lone Chair Larry. <laughs> 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 he gets in a chair and he gets weather balloons. And he hooks to his chair. He gets a cooler and puts him some brew in it and gets him some sandwiches and brings him a BB gun. He figures as he gets a little high in the air when he's ready to come down, he starts shooting those balloons and he'll come down soft. He thought he was only going to go up uh, maybe, maybe 50 foot. He had no idea that he would go up into commercial airspace. True story. So the man goes up into commercial airspace. Now he's not going to shoot anything down because <laughs> so he's got his gun. He's scared to shoot anything. He's flying in commercial airspace. Planes start going by him, and one guy said, "Called, called the called the, air, called the, told the, the, the tower and said, you are not going to believe what we just saw.'" <laughs> and so they scramble the fighter jets, <laughs> and the fighter jets follow him as he finally goes to the ground. <laughs> and of course, when he gets through, he gets arrested. I wonder why. <laughs> Y'all look it up. Long Chair Larry. You look it up on Google. It is a true story. I recall that. Yeah. And so, but again, he was not thinking. They helped, they corrected him. <laughs> Those fighter jets corrected him. Amen. So, so uh, uh, when God is correcting us, just think about this thing. My... There was times I tried my best. I tried my best. Sometimes it didn't work, and I'm sorry. I'm, I'm the only one in here that probably didn't work with. I tried my best when I disciplined my kids to do it positively, to always give it a positive le lesson, to talk about God in it. And even when I had to spank them, I even told them that you're only going to get so many licks, and, you know, this is it. I'm, two licks for that, buddy. And, they got, and if they went, yes, at three. <laughs> Daniel, if I told him one lick, Daniel got one lick. I could tell if you see one lick, he got ten. Because <laughs> he would go, he would go. Yeah. Won't you make it five, Dad? Okay, DC, we'll make it five. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you know DC and that BDC? <laughs> yeah. 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 And so, uh, <laughs> but still, 
There was, I tried not to discipline them when I was angry. And it didn't always work. But most of the time, it, it did work. And that's because I wanted them to understand when they thought about their father disciplining them and then their Heavenly Father disciplining them, then they wouldn't look at it as a negative. It as a positive. Any, any comments? Any questions? I got, I'd like to add something. Go ahead. Um, I've been doing a Bible study with Rick Warren mm -hmm. on my iPad, and you can listen to him too. Mm -hmm. And But he gives a Bible verse, and then he gives... The def, you know, what well, defines it, uh -huh. goes, maybe tells a story or something. What he said the other week, and I'm not, you know, I, I can't remember exactly what it was at because it just came to my mind, but he said a lot of times when we're going through problems and having problems, he said, we say, I can't do this. That's I right. Can't, I can't. He says, well, you need to change that to I won't. That's right. Because, you know, you don't, you say you can't do it, but said so, it's really that you don't want to do it. So you say, you know. And I'll tell you something else is good too. Think about this. Instead of saying, I, I can't do this because you say, well, if I do this, it's like this. Like this, but if I tell you, if I tell you not to hit that hole in the middle of the road, and that's all you think about while we're riding down the road is don't hit that hole, don't hit that hole, don't hit that hole, don't hit that hole. Boom, boom. But if I just say, look, there's a hole down there, just be aware of it, let's keep on going. Let's let it roll. And, and so what I've learned is, instead of saying, I can't, God, I know I can't do this, here's what I say, I don't have to. I don't have to. The other thing I wanted to say was, um, Cheryl Bowen from Emmaus, mm -hmm. she preached at a church the other week. Uh -huh. And so I asked her to send me a copy of a messenger of her sermon. Uh -huh. And she was teaching about, um, you know, in the Bible where God asked his disciples, who, does, who do they say that I am? Mm -hmm. And then he asked them, who do you say that I am? And she said it, it towards the end of it, of her sermon, she said, and I realized this week that I need to turn around and say, God, who do you say that I am? That's pretty Instead cool. Instead of asking, you know, who is God? Or, or what people think of who God is, you know, what people think of who God is, is asking God, God, who do you, That's God, heavy. who do you say I am? That's heavy. And that, that really, I was crying by the time I ended, I finished this, uh, reading her. It was 14 pages long, but it was so good that I was crying by the time I finished it. That's awesome. To and realize, you know, I haven't been asking God, God, who, who do you say I am? You know, so much of the time we... That's powerful. Mm -hmm. It was a very powerful sermon. Yes. She's, she's if anybody awesome. wants to see it, read it. I can send it to you on Messenger. Okay. Anybody else? Y'all ready to pray? Uh -huh. Lord, touch us right now. I thank everybody for coming. Lord, I know you do. I, and I know, God, that we're learning. And help us take it and do something with it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.